about sudden changes in uh, strongly correlated lattice systems. And so what I mean by this is that one prepares a state in some uh, initial state. And I will just call it psi i. And then what you do is to change the parameter in your system and you watch what the state does under the new parameters and how the evolution looks like.
certainly at longer times or close to flash bar resonances, there might be dissipative effects like atom losses or things which one needs to take into account. But I mean, first of all, we will just look at the times which are almost isolated in these systems. And so all these questions have now been studied really a lot, and so I'm not going to cite all the people working on it. It's an enormous amount of publications which came out in the last few years. And so, in particular, these uh, questions on the steady state and thermal state are studied a lot in the, uh, or you are looking at different systems which have an infinite amount of conserved quantities which are non-trivial, so-called integrable systems, or you can do it in non-integrable systems which have only trivial conservation laws and therefore you expect them more to thermalize at some point in these systems. And so I mean there's a lot of research going on in this direction. I would like to first uh, focus on this first point, so the short time dynamics, and tell you a little bit about the formation of correlations in these systems after a sudden quench, and do this in particular in an optical lattice system. But before I get more concrete, let me just, I mean, somehow this setup is very, very simple. We have our initial state, and then we have a part of our Hamiltonian under which we look at the time evolution. Let me call it HF. And so what you can do is, well, typically you cannot do it, but in principle you could do it, is to determine the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. So let me call them N with the energies EN in this system. And if you know all this information, you know the time evolution of the system. If you know that your state can be decomposed, so your initial state can be decomposed onto these different eigenbases, and I will call this just CN. And so you can say that now I decompose my initial state, and so what I'm left with is these eigenstates. I know the time evolution of my eigenstates, it's just with the eigenenergies. And so you have written down the evolution of the system. But I mean, typically in many body systems, it's pretty hard to get either of these in the whole spectrum. So this uh, makes the complication in this treatment. But let me look at this a little bit more carefully. So what you see is that certainly you have always a pure state if you have an isolated system. So what I call here thermalization cannot be something which is on the whole system. The mic is somehow, is it too close? Or? It's fine. It's fine? Okay. So, I mean, you still have a pure system, so it cannot be the whole system which has thermalized in this sense. So you need to find a different definition of what you mean with thermal in this system. And so let us just look at observables. And the time evolution of observables, I just take the simplest case of just one observable which is depending on time. And so you can expand it in the same way, only that you now have your state on this side and on this side. So you need two or three indices. So you sandwich your operator and you have the time evolution which is now the difference and times t. Okay, this does not help yet very much, but I mean what you can further see is that if you assume that you have no degeneracy in your system, so There are two different contributions. One of them is the contribution where these states are equal and you will have no time evolution. 
and the contribution where these states are non-equal, and since we assume non-degenerate ones, you will have a time uh, oscillating time evolution in this uh, system. So let me just write this down. So here you have just the non-evolving term. And then you have the term like above with n, which is not equal. OK, and from this you see already that if you are interested in the long time limit, you could assume that if the frequency don't have a certain structure, you just say they are averaging out and you are left with this so-called diagonal ensemble of the system. And you can deal in the long time limit, you can try to study this ensemble. But at the moment, what I would like to do is to go back and take an operator which is now a correlation function at different distances and look what kind of uh, evolution does this term, which is a pure dephasing term, cause for these kind of correlations. Do the correlations spread? Do they, uh, are they uh, disturbed in another sense? So we will focus on this problem. And so the question, or the system we will look at, is an optical lattice. And so, as always, I'm biased to choose this since I know this best, since I worked on it. But there are many other very interesting examples in the literature, I mean, there are really several hundreds of papers now on this kind of trenches in uh, cold letters. And so let's take an optical lattice. So yesterday we learned that we can form, oh, the first lecture we learned that we can form an optical or a periodic potential for the atoms by just using two counter-propagating light fields which form a standing light field. And so Let's assume this kind of potential for the atoms. So now we can have our atoms moving in this kind of potential. So we will have a so-called tunneling term if the atoms move from one well to the other. So let me write down the many body Hamiltonian directly. So we have a tunneling, which is mainly on neighboring sides. So I remove a particle from side i plus 1 and put it on side i. And certainly the inverse. And depending on the definition for the minus sign. And then if two particles meet on the same side, we had a very short range interaction of the van der Waals potential, which has a range which is much smaller than the lattice size. So what we get now for an interaction is only if the atoms meet on one of these sides. And so we take here an on-site interaction term, which is just given by the density <laughs> operator. So I have n j atoms on the side, and they interact with the remaining atoms on the side. So this is the interaction term. So we have done quite a bit of approximations to get to this Hamiltonian. I will not detail them here because I don't have the time. But I mean, you can happily read them somewhere. So it's called type binding approximation. And I will have something in my notes on this if you want to know more. OK, so many of you know about this uh, was a Hubbard Hamiltonian, as I asked last time. But let me, nevertheless, for the few of you who haven't seen it, just uh, talk a little bit about the quantum phases. So you have now two terms which are competing here. So one term, which is this kinetic term, which is delocalizing the atoms. So here you would just get three bosons or uh, which are on B and C, which is uh, delocalized. And you have this interaction term where you have to pay an energy if two atoms meet on the same left side. So if you can see if you have just one atom here, this gives zero. But if you put two atoms, you get an interaction energy, which is zero. 
So this is a penalty which you have to pay. And so what happens now is that you get a, a quantum phase transition in this model. If you look at the ratio of this parameter, mu over j, at a critical value. <coughs> and so on this side, you have a superfluid. And on the other side, what happens is the bosons really don't want to see each other. And if you have commentary filling, what they do is to localize in each lattice well. So you get a state which is a so-called not insulating state. Which if I just depict the atomic limit, which means for j equal zero. Uh, I'm a little bit close. It's just the same mean number of atoms on the same left side. And so this is for a commensurate thing. Let's say just one of these atoms, 
you don't know where to put this hole and it delocalizes. And so you have directly in transition, you don't form this uh, gap anymore. Uh, I have a question about this transition. Yes. So uh, I think it's not clear what the chemical potential is, but is this transition uh, the same uh, for all different chemical potentials? Okay, so um, then I will not reduce the introduction too much. So let me write now this phase uh, diagram, what I have drawn here is to keep the number of atoms fixed. So one can as well have a look in the, I mean, in the, as a function of the chemical potential. And so let us do it here. And take here the chemical potential. And so what you get there is now, so, uh, wait, that should, no, J over U. So this is the weakly interacting, this is the strongly interacting case. And what you get there is typically this kind of mod lobes, it's called. This is one. So let me explain a little bit. So if you are in the weakly interacting limit, you have just a superfluid region. So this here is all superfluid. And yet it doesn't matter at which density you are. So you can continuously change this chemical potential, and you just increase the density. Since it's not commensurate, it doesn't matter. So you just increase it monotonously. Whereas, if you now go inside this region, you know this phase transition only takes place if at commensurate filling. So these slopes, which I plot here, is really at n equal 1, so a mean filling of n equal 1. Here it's the mean filling of n equal 2. And so only in this case you get these mod insulating loops. And so the line I have drawn here is the line of uh, density 1, which bends a little bit down and goes further in this system. And so equal density lines would now behave like this if they are not commensurate. So you go somehow into this point, okay, it's not nicely drawn, but you go deep inside here, you stay superfluid up to uh, the really case where you have no hopping anymore. And so this is something one can at least easily understand. If one just takes the limit of j equals zero, you can just try to calculate this kind of points and you will see that if you plot the density as a function of the chemical potential, you will get these kind of steps which go up. So this you get just by taking this term plus a chemical potential term. So you add the term which is the minus mu sum over j and j. And you minimize the energy. So this you can do as an easy exercise. And you will find this uh, line, you will find these densities. Uh, so is yes. the transition uh, the same all along this curve? No. So it's closer to tallest? Only in the tip. So this point here is a multi-critical point, which is very special. And in 1D, it's here, so one calls it, this transition one calls the commensurate incommensurate transition. So you go from something which is incommensurate to something which is commensurate. And here this transition point is very special. You are at the commensurate filling, you are, um, so to say, a fixed filling, and you go through here, and in 1D, this is a, a costelid stylus transition. And so, in higher D, you have as well different critical exponents here and here. Okay. So, just, uh, yeah, this was more or less all I wanted to say on the transition. Yes? Why is it easier to have uh, superfluidity if I have? 
n by was a big number. I mean, it seems like it's uh, yes. It's statistics to have a smaller j yes. if my n by n. So let's have a look at a simple picture. I take again. Let me take now two atoms on each side. So what happens if I do this excitation? So I need to evaluate this interaction energy. So what I had initially, so let me say the interaction energy initial, if I have the two everywhere, it's just two times one is u, and I have two sides. So I just take these two sides. So this is two u. And if I do this particle hole excitation, then I hop one over here. I don't have any interaction energy here. But here I have now three. So I have three times two. So I have uh, three u. So you see the difference here is still u. So the difference has not changed. It doesn't depend on the filling. The first gap is always u in this case. But what about the hopping? So if I have this hopping, what I will get is, if I apply this operator here, OK, it's now the other way around. B dagger i plus 1, b i. So there I know I will get a factor. So this I apply on the state, which is n bar, n bar. And so what I will get is here, I will get n bar minus 1. Here I will get n bar plus 1, but I will get the bosonic enhancement factor. And so this will be the square root of n times n plus 1. And so you see whereas the difference in the interaction energy is independent of the number of particles, you get that here you gain an energy by delocalizing the atoms which is enhanced by the bosonic enhancement factor. So it basically means that I can hop any one of those. You can hop much, exactly. Easily said, it's uh, you can either hop this one or you can hop this one to the other side. So you have a factor of two, roughly speaking. And so this means that it's much easier to have up here the superfluid than the water. Okay, so let me just give you as well the value for this uh, critical value. So this can be calculated in mean field, for example, or numerically. So these are bosons, so numerical methods are very strong here. You can do a Monte Carlo in higher dimensions and get very accurate values. But just to give you an idea, it's about 5.8 times the coordination number of the lattice, so the, uh, the number of nearest neighbors of the letters at filling n, which is equal to 1. Certainly, in 1D, this is not a very good approximation. You get a value which is about 3.84 from the numerics. And so this was done by Kühner and Mumin, this reference. But it's in the notes. OK, so this transition has now been observed in these optical lattices. What they did is to load a bosonic cloud into these optical lattices relatively slowly so that they reach almost the ground state of uh, the system. And then what they do is to let this cloud fly apart and look at absorption pictures. So you release both the optical lattice and the trap, the cloud expands. And so what you measure is approximately the momentum profile before uh, you switch off the potentials. And so what you now expect is that in the superfluid, you have coherence over a long range. So what will happen is that these different, somehow, it's like scattering uh, at Young's double slit if you have something coherent which is scattered at the double slit, you will see an interference pattern. Whereas if you do it 
from something which is in in the double slit, you get a very broad background. And so this is exactly what they saw. And I will just misuse some plots which are not the static ones to show you what I mean by this. So for example, the superfluid is this picture over here where you see these very strong interference peaks, whereas the mod insulator is something over there where you see really this very broad huge. And so you have the coherence, so what this probes is the coherence of the... Okay, so now I would like to start with the, one of the initial experiments which is already here, but let me switch it off for a second. So, yes? The one is the thing you were showing. Ah. Uh, okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> so, those, those, those spikes are the. These are the interference peaks. Of the so, typically, if you have a young double slit experiment, which is very similar, so you have just a double slit, you have light which is coming coherently, what you see on your screen is an interference pattern which has some very sharp peaks of the intensity of the laser, uh, of the laser light. And so what you do now here is not to let um, this kind of coherent laser light shine on it, but you have a coherent meta wave which is diffracting on this lattice. So it's very similar to this situation, and this was why you get these very sharp peaks in this system. It's not no, I mean, what's that momentum axis in, in the two, in the two? So, so I mean... It's just sort of the block, the wave function of sort of the block state of the, of the superfluid, right? I think the different peaks are different. Uh, the different peaks, so here you have the first interference peak, and then you have the next interference peak. So here you can think of Kx and Ky, for example. And so what this means in the lattice language is then, um, I mean, this is the prion zone. So you have the different peaks or one interference peak which repeats at the different prion zones. Okay. One of the first experiments which had been done on the dynamics in these systems was then to load the system inside this optical lattice.
So you have oscillations in your system after a certain time. And so this uh, certainly made people a little bit curious. I mean that you have coherence which goes away and then comes back. Has been seen before, but I mean, it's still always surprising. Yes? So is this figure once this potential applied and there's no change on the system? And these oscillations are observed even though there's nothing else? So this is, these pictures are here at different times. Okay, okay. Yes. And so at e each different time you remove the lattice and make a time of light in the yes. engine to get the momentum yes. and then you recreate the system, yes. do the same thing, so it's yes. so extremely tedious or extremely very... Yeah, it's uh, quite tedious for them. <laughs> I mean, they want to optimize the procedure to create their cold cloud. Yes. And so, I mean, each of these pictures is again an average of many, many observations. Yes. So can you remind me about what changed in the previous picture compared to this one? Good. So the previous picture, I just used the same picture. I was lazy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, because the equilibrium picture looks really the same, we don't see the difference. So if you're in equilibrium at a low interaction strength, you see picture A. If you're in equilibrium at a large interaction strength, you see picture B. And so if you change the interaction strength and you always, so what they do there is to switch, to make the switch to a different height so that they go almost adiabatically into the lattice, almost equilibrium, then they see as well these kind of uh, different patterns depending on the final uh, height of the lattice. But I assure you, you will not see the difference. <laughs> okay. So let me give you an easy explanation of this. I mean, the experimentalists uh, knew this themselves. So just to give you one example where you see something particular if you do this kind of question. And so now what we assume is that they ramp up the lattice really, really to a high value. And so that the Hamiltonian can be considered as mainly being this interaction part. Just try to write down the evolution while I'm for yourself to see why if you just take the interaction part you get these oscillations. So we now use this representation which we had before. So we say the wave function, the evolution of the wave function is now given okay, by the application of the Hamiltonian suddenly onto my initial state. And now I said I will just take the new term into account. Nevertheless, to which of these states you apply it. And so what this means now 
is we have an integer, we have e to the minus i u t times some integer. Let me call it f for the moment. But this means now that you can find a period, you know that if this is 2 pi times another integer, you will revive or you will have the same phase again. And so now this number can certainly change from state to state. But let us have a look at the period t, which is defined by this. So this is now um, the 2 pi sum integer over u times the m. And so now what we know is that m is somehow 1 or bigger or will be mainly uh, contributing if it's bigger than 1. Okay, so what this means is if I get something bigger here, this means I get a smaller time. So the latest time after which it revives, and each of these integer revives, is the time where I set this to 1 and this to 1. And so this is the period after which each of the Fox states is reviving in this system if you don't have any hopping in the system. And this is the oscillation system. So you have just a time evolution operator which becomes the identity after a certain time. And so this is why you have, again, the coherence which revives in these systems. And so this is the called as well the revival and collapse. The experiment of the rate function. And so let me note, I mean, this is certainly only Q because you have here an equally spacing of the energy levels so that you have the same frequency distance between the eigenstates which makes them revive. So it's like a harmonic oscillator in some sense. Excuse me? Yes? So from my understanding, so as you evolve along this picture, at some parts, interaction dominates because it's uh, so-called localized. In other parts, hopping dominates. Is this correct? No. I mean, um, uh, yes and no. So in the Hamiltonian, you have only the interaction. So you don't have the kinetic energy anymore. But you still have the delocalization of the initial state. So this gives you the decoherence, uh, the coherence in the system. But I mean the energy is only given by the final Hamiltonian, and there we have assumed that we are in a really, really high lattice where you don't have any hopping anymore. I mean, how do I have superfluid if I don't have? Uh, you don't have superfluid. This I didn't say. Oh, so these are not superfluid phases. The initial state is a superfluid state, which has a lot of coherence. And so now you take this state and you time evolve it with the Hamiltonian and you will see that, okay, in the meantime, if the time is not this time, you get some different frequency for different numbers of n. So somehow this kind of uh, before the coherence that you had in your state will turn away. You will get a different phase for each of them. But then they will come back at this time. They meet again. And so here you have again your original superfluid state. And only in between you have a dephasing of the different contributions of these different Fox states. And then you meet again because you have the same phase after. So it's hard to talk somehow. I mean, you have the delocalization, you have the coherence in the system, but it's not due to the Hamiltonian, so you have not the kinetic energy in the system. Right, so I guess the crucial thing is that this interaction piece only has infinitely conserved quantities, right? Because each nj is a conserved quantity if you only have the interaction, so it has to be some type of periodic system. Exactly. And then there would be some sort of um, thermalization given by the residual small hopping, right? So. Yes, so what I have told you up to now was just taking this part into account. This is certainly an integrable Hamiltonian. You can solve it exactly, and you have an infinite number of conserved quantities, which is exactly these Fox states. So I mean, this is why we have 
this very strange behavior. And so now if you switch on a little bit of hopping, you certainly will get something which does not rewrite fully, but where you, if you plot this coherence peak versus time, so just this uh, maximum of the peak, you get something which first comes back, but becomes smaller and smaller. And so in the experiment you had as well seen this. In the experiment it was just the dephasing which came from the inhomogeneous distribution of the density. But you can as well get it if you break the integrability by switching on the J, then you get as well a dephasing of the state. But I think it's still not totally clarified. I mean, we did quite a bit of work on what is this steady state, what is its characteristics. Okay, so much for this quench. And I'm not sure if Anatoly will discuss it tomorrow as well in his formalism. So then you have seen it already. So now I would like to uh, go a little bit away of this. I mean, this was a very, very simple case where I had no hopping at all and just put the interaction energy. And so now I would do the contrary. And I will switch on somehow a little bit of uh, the kinetic term as well. But I will now not start in the superfluid, but I start in the mod insulator and go down a little bit and look at the evolution of the correlations in this system. And so why do I do this? Because it's theoretically much more easy to describe than in the superfluid. And so therefore, I would like to uh, show you how we can treat this. And you will see that what we find as the evolution is much more general. And this is why I take this example to explain you what has been found in many models by now for this evolution of the correlations. So somehow the situation I consider now is to start here at really a high interaction state and I quench my system down to a smaller value of the interaction state. And so what you would somehow naively expect that somehow the coherence should restore at least to a certain extent. And so I would like to introduce one technique which can be used in this regime of uh, high interaction strength quite well for static properties or other properties. And so this is a quasi-particle approach. Since one sees very nicely the physical interpretation in this kind of approach. And so what we do now is to say, okay, we start in this mod insulator, which was given, it's really the atomic mod insulator where I have a n filling on each of the letter cells. And so what I know is that as long as I stay in the mod insulator regime, the particle fluctuations are typically quite weak. And so what we say now is that we take the local basis, which is typically for uh, bosonic atoms going from zero occupation to the maximum number of occupation. We reduce it drastically and we take now only the states with the filling n. So this is now a local basis on a side j. What we do now is to say, OK, we take now this basis n, and we take plus minus 1 into it. So we have only three local states which we take into account. 
So this is a trust exemplification and typically it works quite well if you're somewhere above this region. What you can now do is to introduce auxiliary operators to describe this kind of, uh, or to describe the action of the normal, normal bosonic operator on this system. And so the aim is it to find auxiliary operators in which your Hamiltonian becomes quadratic, so that you get rid of this interaction term in the Hamiltonian. And so what we need now to look is how does the original operator act on such a state. And so we can take the three different states we have and see what it does. And so this operator always creates a particle. So we can represent it by creating a particle going from n to n plus 1 is represented by this one. But we need to take the bosonic enhancement factor into account, so we get here in one plus one. So this would correctly describe the term where I apply it onto this operator n. So now we need as well to apply it onto the operator n minus one. So this operator applied to n minus one gives nothing. And so what we will see is that one needs, now we need to destroy the minus operator, which is somehow uh, the whole, we need to destroy the whole to get the average value n here. And so here we have the square root of n, which is the bosonic enhancement factor. And so if one does this, you can check that on all the three states you get the correct action of the operator. Further, these uh, A's are bosonic operators. So they fulfill the bosonic commutation relations. <laughs> I'm not going to do the calculation. But one has an additional constraint. Since, I mean, if you have created an excess particle, you cannot create another excess particle. I mean, it doesn't make sense to somehow create two, twice an excess particle. So what you want is that if you apply this operator twice, that this gives zero. And the same for the minus one. You cannot create two holes on the same side. 
this would, I mean, this does not make sense physically. And so analogically, the annihilation operator can as well not act twice on the same side. Then, additionally to this one, you certainly have as well the case where you have the excess particle acting on the excess operator and the whole operator. But I mean, it doesn't make sense as well to have a whole and an excess particle on the same side. So what we need to uh, make or constrain as well is that if we have, now if we are counting the number of excess particles on a side and the number of holes on a side, that this is zero. So we can have either an excess particle or a hole on the side. since a long time, let's say. And I mean, it was used quite a bit, uh, for example, by Ehud Altman and Hassan Auerbach for the first time to as well calculate something time-driven uh, time in these old atomic systems. And I mean, there's very nice papers by Sebastian Huber and Jamie Platter, who use this kind of bosonic uh, quasi-particles. So they are as well very good in equilibrium to obtain results, and very much used there. But, I mean, during the quench which I have described you, we started to apply these operators, and we noticed that, sadly, what we see is that the occupation here, if you cannot enforce this exactly, grows up in your, your face and uh, this approach somehow, if you cannot enforce these constraints exactly, blows up. And so what we did is to use another approach, which is now to do another, introduce another auxiliary particle, which is now a fermionic one. So why do we do this? For fermions, this would be fulfilled directly. So we don't have to impose this from outside, but for fermions this is easily fulfilled. Whereas this one is still not fulfilled. So this will be the one which is uh, remaining and which we need to see how to treat it in the problem. So let me mention, so this approach works very well as well in 2D and 3D. So this bosonic one, but how we go now to one, uh, to the fermionic ones, we use a Jordan and Wigner transformation, which is more easily done in one dimension. So the remaining will be mainly for one dimensional systems. So let us do a Jordan and Wigner transformation. Side J, and I put the minus sign 
corresponding to the number of fermions. So for the one has as well to order the spin up and the spin down. And this is why the string for the plus and the minus are a little bit different. So now for the minus operator, we just get a single term which is more, which counts the number of plus eta fermions which is on the side. So this is just convention. <coughs> Okay, so now we have these C's which are fermionic operators, but as I said before, what we want to obtain is a quadratic Hamiltonian. So let me discuss why we have now a quadratic Hamiltonian in these operators. Sorry about that. 
come in different signs. The third term of the why do you come in different signs? It's uh, due to the commutators. It's uh, due to the introduction of the strings which we had. Okay. So one has to carefully write down. I mean, you want bosonic hopping. So in the fermionics, this can be the design in these systems. OK, so what did we gain? It's a quadratic Hamiltonian. If we neglect the projector. <coughs> and so this is what is typically done. You just neglect the projector and you solve this uh, Hamiltonian and the time it goes. And so what one, so this is as well what we now do. So I will not do the calculations here. I think you are all familiar to Google Lugov transformation that you can diagonalize this Hamiltonian. So let me just write down. Neglect the projector means I put the projector to identity. And so then can be calculated. I will remove transformation. And you find the Hamiltonian which is diagonal in the new Bogolubov operators. So let me say Bogolubov operators. I will now use gamma plus and gamma minus. And so I don't want to uh, outline this step. So what you do is to diagonalize a Hamiltonian. And then you can, for these uh, operators, easily get the time evolution of the operators. And then we express the time evolution of the state with these time dependent operators. And so what you obtain? which we have met, made. So the approximations were that we reduce to these three states, three local states, and that we neglect this projector. Otherwise, everything is exact. So, and this time evolution is now given by a product of a k, and you have some transformation coefficients, which depend on k, and what is important you have here, this is the dispersion relation of the Google-Lubov particles. Times t. So this gives you the time evolution. And we have here a term which creates you <coughs> a Bogolyubov quasi-particle of this excess form, and it creates you a Bogolyubov particle of the whole form. Apply to your initial wave function. Okay, so what we see first of all, ah, sorry, there must be a minus sign. So what you see is that you create Google of quasi particles which are counter propagated. 
and you create always a plus and a minus uh, at the same time, and they are counter properties. Then these quasi particles evolve with a dispersion relation, and they propagate through the system. So let me just reduce this expression uh, in the limit that we are, have a final Hamiltonian where the interaction is still quite big. Because then we can go to an even more simple picture, which is just these uh, excess particles and holes. So what one finds is then that one can expand these coefficients. And one obtains that this time evolution state is the original atomic mod insulator. Then there's a state which is just a constant state, which is the correction to the final interaction or the sine k. So you see this term is just constant. And then there's one term, which is the important one. Which has quite a similar form, but now you have here the time evolution of your function T over H of the operators CK plus C minus K minus applied on K. And so what I did here is really just to go to the large interaction. I mean, this expression you can evaluate numerically. But just to see a little bit more clearly what happens, let us consider this large case. So you have your original state. You have a correction. And this is the correction to make or to, to have an eigenstate again. So this is just a perturbation correction. And then you have the part which is evolving. And so what the quench did now is to create from the originally homogeneous state, it creates quasi-particles which have an excess particle and have somehow a hole. So you have your state. And what you do is now something like this, whereas this excess particle propagates with a certain momentum in one direction, and the whole propagates in the other direction. And so this propagation, how fast this propagation is, is given by the um, dispersion of the quasi-particles. So this we saw over here. And so this dispersion in the large interaction limit is just a cosine dispersion. So this is why I have the cosine over here. And so you see, but it is not that one really creates this in real space, but what we have is a coherent superposition of different functions of all these different pairs of neighboring sides. But you have as well the same, we created on this side, over here, on the next side, and you have a coherent superposition of all of these creation of these quasi particles and these propagate each of them in each of this superposition state let me write it a little bit sketchy like this we have the propagation of these particles or this excess particle and the holes in counter direction and so this is something which is much more general has been seen in other models beforehand and this was why I wanted to show you at an easy example how one can somehow uh, calculate this and see this. So let me give you some references, or first of all one reference, which is the reference of uh, Calabresa and Cardi. So what they propose is that you create by a quench in a conformal field theory, you create this kind of uh, antenna quasi particles, which then propagate semi classically 
for the system. So it's a PL 2006 type. And so since then, there have been many models in which this has been seen by now. So I wanted to show you now that this is as well something which one can see in experiments. And so for this, let me okay, show you these experiments over here. So these are in the group of uh, Markus Greiner and Emanuel Bloch, two different experimental setups. But what is common to them is that they have a microscope, so this big lens over there, that they have a very, very good resolution of uh, or resolution in space. So they really can monitor signal lattice in this system. And so what they can see is typically what they do is to increase the optical lattice very rapidly to freeze the distribution in the system and then shine in light and scatter many photons for of each atom so that they can see single atoms in these sites. And so uh, during this process what happens is that if you have not only one atom in the sites but two atoms, you lose the atoms. So typically what you, they scatter with a photon and uh, the two atoms so you lose them. So what you will see is only the parity distribution which is locally resolved. So you will see if you have an even or odd number of atoms in these systems. But this is quite nice because this parity distribution, if you do single shot measurements, you can as well extract the correlation function from it. And so they can get, for example, the even-even density correlation at different, over different uh, distances. And this is exactly what we somehow need if we have now created our quasi-particles, which in the large view limit correspond to these excess particles or holes, this means we have changed the parity by these quasi-particles. And so we will get, if this is the uh, background density, and we have changed it here by one, let's say created a hole and a dugon, this will give the same signal, and we will measure the correlation directly between these quasi-particles in the system. Certainly, if you go to lower U, you get some corrections to this picture. But just take the simple picture of this zeros and double occupied site, which you can now measure here. And so these are the results which they found by doing this measurement. And so So this is now this correlation of the parity versus time. And so it is measured for different distances. So the upper curve is the distance 1, distance 2 is below, and so on. So this is really the distance of the correlation. This is not the measurement of the density. The density stays constant in the system during this process. And so they took or loaded the atoms into this high optical lattice and suddenly switch down the optical lattice. And this is the result what they see. So they see now this evolution. First of all, they see this kind of peak coming up here. And then they see that if you go to further distances, this peak comes up at a little bit later time and moves somehow through the correlations in the system. So you have somehow really these quasi-particles or you can now really see in these correlations these quasi-particles which spread through the system and get different distances and therefore you see this peak which evolves through the system. And so just to mention, um, so the, the points is the experimental results, the line is the quasi-particle approach and we did as well numerical simulation for it which is this green line which certainly fits much better but, uh, I mean, the quasi-particle approach at least gives you the rough structure, even if it cannot give the correct amplitude in this situation, because we are here already at a relatively low interaction strength. Sorry, uh, 
Yes. So what are the solid lines? So the solid lines is uh, the imaging. I mean for the lower part. D equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's the same coding. So this is the quasi-particle approach, the DMG, and the points is the uh, experimental results. Oh, sorry. What, and what so is so this red line is just a guide to the eye of the peak moving through the system. What, what is D here? The small D. The small D is the different distance of the correlation. Oh, I, I saw those dimensions, sorry. This is here, this distance of the correlation which you measure. Uh -huh. And what is the dimension? 3D or? This is in 1D. 1D. Okay. So they created one dimensional tubes and look just in 1D how it's spreading. Yes, so this was, I mean, since I introduced the fermions, it was for one dimensional systems. And I mean, this uh, conformal field theory systems and the systems I mentioned, these are one dimensional systems in which these kind of quasi-particle entanglement spreading has been seen. Okay. So just to show you that if we don't have this uh, very low interaction strength, this is now again the uh, comparison of the quasi-particle approach and the numerics. You see it works much better if you have a higher final interaction strength. So just to give you a little bit of confidence that with this approach one can really uh, describe the system relatively well. Yes? I'm a bit lost. So this was for fermions, right? This no, the experiment is for bosons, bosons. in one week. So only our quasi-particles are fermions. So why do I have this type of uh, eigenstates for bosons? The so fermionic ones? Uh, I'm lost mm -hmm. here. So you started with fermionic Hamiltonian? I started with a bosonic Hamiltonian. Oh, okay. I have a bosonic system. And now what I did was first to introduce bosonic quasi-particles or operators which are somehow representing the excess particle and the whole. Mm -hmm. But since I said that I cannot have two excess particles on one side, what I did is to uh, include this constraint and artificially introduce fermionic operators. So you introduce Jordan in a transformation? Exactly. For this. So in some sense, I can think of fermions. In this sense, you can think of fermions of the quasi-particles. OK, so these quasi-particles are strongly interacting? Here in this system, I have uh, I mean, what you see is that you only create two of them which are counter-propagating, so they don't need we don't need to care about the interaction. I mean, if they don't interact, why do they have such a coherence? And I mean, at least you have to have a little bit of interaction to have that kind of. I am thinking naively about BCS. So you have here. You have created the pairs. Uh -huh. So this is your coherence, uh, which so you have created by the quench in the system. And quench is strong interaction, which is So the original system is a strongly interacting mod insulator. And in this strongly interacting mod insulator, you find now a coherence evolution of these quasi particles. So that's and I just want to show you here some numerical results. Works. not changing too much 
It is just that you get some kind of uh, tail if you go to weaker interactions. And so I have not much time left. So what I would have liked to, to show you as well is that one can really show analytically that this onset of the the onset of the correlations is really before this peak comes it's exponentially suppressed so this we can show analytically so in this region you have an exponential suppression of the correlation here before the peak arises there is no change or exponentially small change and only afterwards you see a change so you have a kind of light cone which propagates out in these systems so I would like to summarize this in a plot so I have here my distance I have the time and so now what I see is that at larger distance I have only something changing at larger time so here I have exponentially small changes whereas in this regime I see this peak coming and big changes occurring and so that you have this kind of maximal or this velocity now here of this light cone is set by the maximum velocity from the quasi-particle dispersion relation so if you have your quasi-particle dispersion relation omega versus k typically something like a cosine let's say what you have is that the velocity is defined by the derivative with respect to k so it's the slope of the dispersion relation and so if you have a bounded dispersion what you see is that there exists a maximal velocity somewhere in this dispersion relation so let me call it here it's this slope over here and so this light cone or there is a maximal velocity which is set by this maximal velocity of the quasi particles outside of which only exponentially small changes occur and only after this something happens in the system and so this was or is a very general theory in uh, has been found or proven mathematically for spin systems and it's called the Nick Robinson And this is a really, really important theorem from which many different things have been proven. And so I recommend this paper to you if you're interested. It's quite old already. But I mean, there has been many work which is based on this uh, proof of this Lee Robinson's bound in the systems. And let me just mention some names. Kavi, for example, uh, proved that this form which I have shown here for the equal time correlations that there is a maximal bound. I mean, Hastings has proven the exponentially clustering theory that if you have a gap in the system, you have exponentially decaying correlation. So, I mean, it's really a very important theory in these systems. In these bosonic systems, it has not been proven, and counterexamples have been seen. But, I mean, here we see that if you stay at this low energy sector, everything is behaving like one expects from the system. So, to uh, conclude, let me just make some more. Uh, uh, comments on what I wanted to say on the thermalization. So what you see is that first of all you have these short time dynamics 
where the light cone is spreading out. And so if you want to look for a steady state of thermalization, you can only look somewhere here. And so you will have always for, um, or in this short range interacting Hamiltonians, you will always have this kind of evolution outwards, at least in these uh, systems, in the spin systems of which it's proven. And you can only expect something which is steady or thermal at these distances setting in later on. And so sadly, I didn't have now the time to talk a little bit about this thermalization. But I mean, if you are interested, just ask me after the lecture. And so thanks for being so brave to still be here for this last afternoon lecture. And uh, I would like to talk to you.